All right, hello everybody and welcome. Today we're gonna to be covering some of the basics of learning how, I guess, writing C-sharp code, reading C-sharp code, and understanding how game programming really works. I wanna go over the fundamentals and make sure that people that have kind of wanted to get into programming or kind of been in the field, maybe as a designer or an artist, can get into it and get a better understanding of what's going on. I feel like a lot of the time when I put out tutorials, I kind of assume a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding, and this time we're going to skip that and assume pretty much nothing, go through the basics of C Sharp and uh, what you really need to know, what the different parts of the things are that, that you really need to understand, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So let me switch over to a desktop mode real quick so you can see the quick outline of the plan of the things that I want to cover today. We're going to start with some game objects, just what they are, how you create them. Most people will probably know that, but just in case. And then we'll get into creating scripts, what a class looks like, um, what the built-in methods look like, and what a mono behavior actually is, fields, properties, creating methods, and then calling code on other things. And eventually, once I get through all of this, we'll also take questions. Also, if people have questions along the way, Feel free to ask them in chat. I have a sense that there are a lot of people here who can answer your questions. So while I'm going through, if something you have something that you just want a little bit more clarity on, just drop a question in chat and somebody else will probably answer it. If not, maybe I'll, I'll be able to get to it as well. But I, I want to make sure that I'm covering everything and that it's really easy for everybody to understand. So I'm going to start by just jumping into Unity. We'll begin at the very basics. So I've got an empty scene here where I just added a cube that I named ground and I scaled it up. So the scale is, what is it, 10 by 10 on the X and the Z and one on the Y. And then I have a player where I just created a capsule. And let's remove that extra script there. So I've got a player where I just created a capsule added a rigid body, and then opened up the constraints and freezed all of the rotation. And then I moved it just up above the, the plane here, or the, the cube, and then set it up so that it would fall down. I'm just going to have this as kind of a, a basic thing that we can interact with, and then see what our code's doing, and get a, get a feeling that it's actually working. All right, so with our player set up, let's talk about game objects and scripts in general. So in in Unity, the general concept of things is that every object or everything in Unity is attached to what we call a game object. And a game object lives in a hierarchy of game objects in a scene. We can have multiple scenes open. Scenes are kind of like levels. In this case, though, we're going to just assume one scene with multiple game objects here. You can see I've got a main camera, a directional light, a ground, and a player. And those are my different game objects that I've already got created. I can create a new one by hitting create empty. And that just gives me an object with a transform on it and no other components. I can hit escape and delete that. I can go game object, go to 3D object, and create one of these pre-made ones, kind of like I did with that player and the, uh, the ground there. Let's create a sphere real quick, and you'll see that it creates the transform here, but it just automatically adds on a couple of other components. I can actually remove these components. So I can go in, right click, remove all of these components, and now it's back to being just like an empty game object. So everything in Unity that you'll see is going to be built up of multiple game objects, or it's gonna be a game object that's built up of multiple components, or multiple game objects usually, kind of all put together. So let's take a look at how we can use code now. So game objects, relatively simple, but how do we use code to control our own game objects? First thing we need to do is actually write some code. And we have two ways that we can create a script where we can write code. We can either use the add component method. So if I have a game object selected like my player, I can hit add component and I can choose the new script option down here in the bottom right corner. Let's pull that up again. So I hit add component and then go down here and choose new script. And I can just give it a name of player hit enter, and then it'll create a new player script in this root of my assets folder. So it's automatically created a script and it attached it to the player object. I'm gonna remove that, delete it, and go through the other way to create it real quick. So if I remove it by right clicking hit remove and then I delete the script out, it's all gone. Let's go select that player again once it finishes re-importing. All right, so I go select the player, you can see the script is gone. The other way that I can create a script is to right click in my project view choose create and choose C sharp script. And then I can just name it again, name it player. But the difference here is that it didn't automatically attach to my player object. 
So if I select my player here, notice that there's no player script attached to it anymore. I need to drag it and pull it over here. Another thing that's worth noting is that this doesn't need to match the name here. I've got this one named player and the script is named player. That's just a coincidence because they happen to both be my player object and I wanted to keep the names relatively simple. These could be named completely different. The names don't necessarily matter. I would recommend that you stick with good names that make sense, but it's not a technical constraint or anything. All right, now let's talk about editing, reading, and writing the code. So I've got a script that I've added and created. I've attached it to a player, and I want to open this thing up and actually add some implementation to it or see what this script does by default. I can double click on it right here, or I can double click on it down here to open up my code editor. So let's do that now. And it's going to open up in Visual Studio. Now, a lot of people who watch my channel might know that a lot of the time I don't use Visual Studio. I use JetBrains Writer for most of my code. But because this is a beginner video, I want to use the stuff that people are actually going to have installed by default. And there's no reason that you need to switch or anything. If you're already using Visual Studio, don't think that you need to switch over to using something else just because that's what I happen to do. Okay, it looks like it finally opened up. It just reopened in a weird or new instance that was way resized didn't quite fit all right there we go i've got my code up here let's zoom out and take a look at it first let's move my big old head out of the way there we go and we'll take a quick zoom and go through this class so by default we get a class that's got a lot of stuff in it and if you've never looked at c sharp you've never looked at code before it's probably a little bit daunting you hit create new file and you get all of these different lines here with different squigglies. Some stuff's grayed out, some stuff is black, some stuff is green, some's blue. The color coding's a little bit off here because uh, something with Visual Studio today, I guess. But you get the idea. There's a lot of stuff here, and I can see how if you're not used to it, this could be a little bit overwhelming. So we're gonna first go over the fundamentals of what this class looks like, what this is, what a class is, what all of this stuff is. So let's go look at our plan here. So we've got game objects, we've created a script, we're gonna go through class structure next. So let's take a peek. And somebody's asking why is it in a uh, light mode? Again, because that's just the default. Normally I use dark mode in writer, but since the default is light mode in Visual Studio or in VS Code, that's what I wanted to stick with. Make sure that it's easy for everybody that's getting started. All right, so let's take a look at what we've got here. First, up at the top, you have some statements that all say using. In general, when you're new to Unity, you can mostly ignore these. If you're, if you're new to programming and you're not doing a whole lot, you probably don't need to think too much about these at first. Eventually, you're going to need to. They're essentially a way to specify what parts of Unity or what parts of C Sharp we want to use. By default, it automatically pulls in Unity Engine, which is like kind of the core of the game development engine and the core of what we need. It's got most of the things that we need. This is kind of like a package full of tools that it's got, and it's got most of them in there. So we don't need to worry about it too much. And it's got these other two for collections. And we're not even going to touch collections, so you can just kind of ignore the fact that those are grayed out. I wouldn't worry too much about them. The grayed out just means that they're not used black means that it is used. This little minus here will actually allow me to collapse it and hide them. I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing that though if you're really new to Unity because you might not realize that they're hidden and you might not realize that you need to expand them out because the same happens here and you might just kind of miss it. So you can't expand and collapse things. That's what the minus and plus is. Doesn't change your code. It's just for visual and seeing through stuff. All right, so let's see what we have after the using statements. On line five, we have the beginning of our class. We have this word public and then we have class, and then our word player. And player is what we named it. Notice that this matches the file name here. Player.cs is the name here. And this is actually one of the few technical requirements. The name of this class must match the file name for it to work as a game object component. So for you to be able to attach it to your game object, these names must match. If they don't match, you'll see an error. You won't be able to attach it. It won't work. So make sure that those match. If they don't match, just rename it. You can hit Control R R, Control R, Control R, or F2 to go into rename mode. Or you can just right click and find rename and see what your hotkey is if your hotkey happens to be something different. All right, so we have this public class player. Public, you don't need to worry too much about. It just means that this class is usable by other things outside of um, 
well, outside of this class. So it, it's not something that you need to worry about at all when you're beginning. All of your classes are generally going to be public when you're starting out in programming or when you're starting out in game development. Just assume that every class is going to have the public keyword before it. There are some other ones. You just don't need them in the more basic stuff. You need them as you get much more advanced and they're really for protection and for making your code safer for yourself, not for any technical thing. The class thing just means that, hey, this is going to be a class or an object that we can create and do something with. A class essentially means, hey, this is going to be some sort of an object that we're going to create, have some data on it, maybe it will run something. It could be a player, it could be a bullet, it could be a weapon, it could be an NPC, it could be a bot, it could be a building, whatever the thing is that's going to have data and maybe do some, op do some actions. Now behind the player, this is the part that's kind of Unity magic. And if you learn C Sharp stuff and you've never learned Unity, you might be a little bit confused. Or if you're just trying to get into C Sharp and Unity development, but you're going through a lot of C Sharp tutorials, this is kind of where they might, mi might miss something. And it's the magic of the base class of a mono behavior. So when you have a class here, what you can do at the beginning of the class declaration, before all these squiggly braces and all this other nonsense, is you can add in a colon and you can put in another class. So mono behavior is just another class that was already created. And you can say, hey, this player class should have all of the functionality of this other class um, automatically. So give it this automatically. Like It's like having a, um, a base of a, a car and you're using that and then you're creating a sports car off of it. It's got all of the core stuff, the wheels and all that. And you're just adding, I, that's probably a terrible analogy. I need a better analogy for it. But essentially, it's a, it, this mono behavior is a class that's full of all this other stuff, doing a bunch of Unity-specific magic, almost magic. Essentially hooking it up with all of Unity systems. I call it magic, but really, it's hooking it up with Unity's physics system, the rendering system, the game object component system the root that hierarchy that we have there so that we can find and interact with objects it's doing a whole lot and it's calling some methods automatically when we do that and that's why we have these two methods down here that are kind of automatically added and we'll talk about those in just a minute but essentially having this colon and a mono behavior makes it so that this class can be added on to a game object if we don't have this mono behavior if i delete this out let's just do that right now i'll hit delete and i will save and we'll go back into unity and let's take a look at our player just to show what, what happens when we do this there we go it says the script associated cannot be loaded please fix any errors and if i remove it and then try to add it on i see that it says that the script player does not contain a class derived from unity engine dot mono behavior so it just says that it needs to be a mono behavior the player class does to be able to attach it so let's go back in i'll hit Control z to undo just a nice little hotkey. Control Z is undo on almost all computers, or Command Z on a Mac, and undo that, and just fix that right back up. Okay, so we've got our class declaration here. We have a public class named Player that has all of the core stuff of a mono behavior. Then on line six, we have a squiggly brace, and this is the one that's right next to the P key, at least on on my keyboard. It's next to the P key. You hold Shift and hit it, and you get that little squiggly brace. If you don't hold Shift, you get the square braces here. So the squiggly brace here declares or defines what's inside of the class. It's the beginning and the end of the class. So right now it's got all of this stuff in it. I can delete that and I still have a valid class because I have the public class and I've got my squiggly brace to start and the matching squiggly brace to end. The fact that I have a mono behavior doesn't necessarily matter. I don't have to have that to have it be a valid class. But if I want to be able to attach it to a game object, I need that on there. So I'm going to hit Control Z and undo it. I'm going to hit Control Z and undo my deleting of my start. And then let's see what happens if I add in an early exiting brace real quick. So I'll add in a line, and I'm going to add in a closing squiggly. So right next to the backslash, uh, one over from the P, shift and the square brace right there. And what I've done now is completely break my code. And I see this a lot. This happens to people who are working in Unity and they don't realize what happened or they're working in C Sharp, they don't realize what, what's going on. What actually happened is that I've ended my class before all of this code. So all of this code no longer is inside of a class def definition. So my class kind of ends right here. It starts and ends right there. 
And then I've got all of this stuff that's sitting outside of a class. And it says here, feature top level statements not available in C Sharp 8. So essentially, it, well, it's saying that there's an upgrade in a new version that would allow me to kind of do something similar to this. Ignore that. Really, the problem is that this code needs to be inside of a class. You can't really run code outside of a class or a struct. There's, we're not gonna talk about structs, but they're essentially like a class. But you need to have all of your code inside of a class. So to fix this, I can just delete that closing squiggly brace. And if you get a little bit mixed up on it, you can always just take the stuff that you know works, select it all, control X to cut it, and then paste it in. And then go, oh look, there's an extra squiggly brace down here. Let's delete that one. Doesn't matter which squiggly brace, just matters the number of starting and closing ones. So I've got my class here. I can expand and collapse it. I can see all of the stuff inside it. And now let's jump back over to Millinote and let's talk about these built-in methods and the core of a mono behavior. So let's jump back in. Let's see, we've got let's see, this one right here. I get two instances of Visual Studio. And let's take a look at some of the stuff that the mono behavior does for me. So first off, I wanna mention that when you create a class that's a mono behavior, if you're familiar with C Sharp and you've done a lot of C Sharp coding, you might be used to the habit of using a constructor where you do something like this. You do CTOR and it creates a constructor that has public player with no return type, doesn't say void or bool or int or anything else. And then in here, it will create code or run code whenever you create a new instance of the player. Because Unity handles the life cycle of objects, we can't write anything in the constructor. We don't have access to it. It won't fire off. It's not going to run. But we do get a bunch of special methods that Unity gives us instead. So Unity, and, and these special methods are very valuable. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like we're losing a constructor and not getting anything. We're losing a constructor, but you're getting a whole lot of extra stuff. So the first thing is you get a method on start. So the start method is called right before the first frame of an update. So right when your game starts off, the start method is called on every one of your game objects. There's actually some stuff that's called a little bit before that, but starts the first one that they kind of introduce you to. It gets called right at the beginning before your player can actually interact with the game. And then there's update, the other one that they put in automatically, which gets called every single frame. So if you're running at 60 frames a second, this gets called 60 times per second for every object that has this script on it. So if I have a message in here, in fact, let's add in a little bit of a message into our update just to see what that frame rate thing is like and what I'm talking about with update and what I'm talking about with start. So we'll begin by just writing a little bit of code that writes out to the console log. And this can come in really handy if you're getting used to code and you're kind of curious to see what's going on. You're trying to debug a project that you're working on and you're not really sure how to do it or what's going on. One thing you can do is write in a debug log. So you can do debug. So inside of, actually let's talk a little bit about where we write code on a method first. And let's talk about a method declaration and comments before we write any code. So on line seven, we have what's called a comment. The reason that it's this green is that I've got the two slashes here. And that just means that it's not read by the computer at all or the compiler or the engine. It's just for us to read and, and understand as a programmer. If I delete out that slash, suddenly I have an error because I have invalid code. I need to have two slashes. The other way to write a comment is a slash and a star followed by a star and a slash at the end. That allows you to do multi-line comments. So you can say like, hello, more stuff here. But most of the time you'll just see people put slashes across all of, all of them like that. So they'll just do a bunch of lines and put slashes in the front. Now below that we have void start. So the void keyword just means that this start method doesn't give us back anything. It doesn't return anything. Now that might not make any sense if you've never seen anything returned from a method. So if you haven't, don't worry about it. We're gonna return something from a method in a minute. But for now, just know that void means that it doesn't return anything. It just runs some code. It can fire it off and it'll do its thing and we don't care about the result, or at least we don't ask it for a result. Start is the name of the method, and that's one of these magic mono behavior methods. We're going to create our own method with a special name or with our own name later, but start and update are both magically named or already named methods in a mono behavior. And they use a special type of, it's almost like they're using inheritance, but it's not a virtual keyword that we can override for the people that are more advanced. But think of it kind of like that. It's essentially calling back to the start using some reflection. A little bit more advanced for people. Anyway, 
inside of our start method is defined by, well, these squiggly braces, the open and close of that method. So just like we've got the open and close of our class, we have the open and close of our method. And inside the method is where we can put some code. So if I want to write in a log or a, an entry to our debug log, I can use the code debug with capital D dot log, which is actually using the debug classes log method. So this is actually a class that has what we call a static method named log. And then we hit the open parentheses, which is shift and nine. And then we just need to give it a message and it says object, but really we want to give it a string. So we want to put quotation marks and I'm just gonna, oops, I don't know why it put the word debug. Let's get rid of that. Put quotation marks. And I'm just going to put called start. And then at the end of it, we need a semicolon. At the end of every executable line of code in C-sharp, you're going to need a semicolon. There are a couple exceptions and ways around it, but in general, expect that with most of your code, you're going to have a semicolon at the end of any executable code. Now that doesn't apply to your structure code. So your braces here that define the structure of stuff, those don't get ended with a semicolon. You don't need a semicolon there. You can not put one there even. Look, you get a nice little error. So you want to make sure that, oh, what I was going to say is oh, you can put multiple semicolons accidentally after something. You can delete those out too, but you, you don't, yeah, you just keep a single semicolon after each one of these lines. Another thing to note, if I have two lines here and I'm missing a semicolon, watch what happens. Oh, good. It's actually giving me a good error. Sometimes it'll give you the error, or at least it used to give me the error on the wrong line saying the next line was invalid. So now I've got my log entry saying debug.log called start. Let's save this off. I'm going to jump into Unity. And I'm um, actually, you know what I'm going to do before I jump in there? I'm going to save your time. I'm going to copy this line. So I'm going to select the entire line. This is something you should get used to too. If you're writing a lot of code, start to get familiar with your keyboard shortcuts. They're going to come in handy. It's going to save you a ton of time. So I select the whole line, hit control C to copy it. I'll click down here on line 16, which is inside of the control for my update. So inside or inside of the structure of my update method, and I'll paste that in with control V or shift insert is also the way to do it. But control C, control V and control X hotkeys everybody should be using regularly. All right, so now I just want to change the word start to update. So I'll double click that control C, double click that control V. And now I've got my debug log to say when I call update. Let's jump into Unity and see what that looks like and see how we get these log entries or if we get these log entries. So we're in Unity. We'll hit play real quick. And then if I go over to this console window, oh, do, do I not have my player script? Okay. So notice that I don't get anything on there. And the reason for that is that my player script isn't actually attached to my player. So if I select the player when I recreated that player script, I didn't drag it back on. Or when I remade it into a mono behavior, I didn't drag it back on. And this is something that I, I think is important to show because it happens all the time. It's something that I probably do at least once a week where I create a script, I write it all up, and I get things set up, and then I just I run it and it doesn't work, and I realize that I didn't attach it or that somehow I made a mistake and removed the script. So let's hit play now and watch our log of the two entries that we've just added. So I go to my console, and you can see here we've got called start was the first thing, and then we've got called update. And you can see the time's actually updating there. If you look down here in the corner, it's actually called a couple thousand times so far. So every single frame, it's calling um, this or writing out this message. So I've had 10,000 frames since we started the game. If I expand out my stats little window here, you'll see that, yeah, we're getting about four or 500 frames a second. There's really nothing going on in the scene. So it's not a big surprise. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Now, if you don't see yours with a number there, it's because you don't have the collapse option on and you're just seeing the log just spamming down here, going, 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 going. And, and continuing on. I'm going to stop playing though, and I'm going to go back into code, but this time I want to show you another interesting or fun way to do it. If you're looking at a log in your console and you want to see where that log is coming from, you can actually just double click on it and Visual Studio or your code editor will open up right to the line and it looks like it even highlighted the line the line for me. Now, I don't want to necessarily log that I've called update every frame. This technically will be a 
performance issue in a real game if I was doing this regularly. You don't want to go around just adding debug logs to your live project and committing them into it. So if you're working on a project as a designer or an artist and you want to try logging some stuff out, log it, but then when you're done with it, remove it. Don't, don't keep that around as something that you have in there permanently because there is a small performance hit to it. All right, let's jump over to our plan again and let's take a look at fields next. So a field is a thing in Unity. So let's jump into it, or a, not in Unity. A field is another part of a class in C Sharp. So we have methods. We have our start method and our update method. Another thing that we can add inside of a class is a field. And a field is essentially a piece of data or an object that holds some bit of data. I'm going to add in two new lines here go up to line seven, and I'm gonna create a field that's just a string. First, we'll just make a public field, public string, and I'll call this, um, let's call this first name. There we go. So I've got my player and they've got their first name. I just wanna pick something super generic so we can jump into Unity and see what this does. If I make this a public string, now, by the way, I didn't mention what a string is. A string is just a, collection of text or a word or something essentially like this called start. It's a phrase or a word or it could be a single character, a giant length of text. It's just some amount of text that we can use or yeah, read and write. Essentially, it's mostly almost always human readable, but some some exceptions, of course. All right, let's jump into Unity. I, I can think of a couple exceptions where we put non-human readable stuff in strings, but most of the time you see it's human readable stuff. So I say, hey, this first name, look at that. It appeared as a property. Let's move my head out of the way again. I want to make sure that that doesn't become a problem. So now that I've added a first name field to it, I have an actual property that shows up or not really a property, a, a setting where I can type in a name. I can say, Jason, hey, my name is Jason. Let's go back into that player script and let's use that first name field. So in our update, I'm gonna, instead of logging out our update method, we'll say debug.log, and we're instead of logging a quotated, or a, a string with quotation marks around, not quotated, I don't, I don't know what that was, where that was going, but instead of writing out our text with quotation marks around it, let's just pass in another string that's a variable, or our field, that first name. So I'll type in first name, add in a semicolon at the end, and Visual Studio automatically added this this closing brace here, and then I just hit the semicolon. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. The editors will generally do a lot of this stuff for you. So if you find yourself typing it and you add in a brace and you're like, oh, well, why are there two there? It's because it probably automatically added it for you. It's predicting what you want, and then you typed it in as well. So it's one of the things that you'll have to get used to as you're typing in Visual Studio or Writer or whatever it is, but it will save you a lot of time. Let's save that off though, go back into Unity and see what it's like. See if we can use our field now in our update method. So we hit play. I got my called start and you can see it's called and it's just writing out my name. I'm gonna hit collapse though and let's change this name. I'm gonna change this name to Jason Story. Notice how it changed every time. So it was updating and as it was updating, look at how many frames ran as I started changing names. Jason with a space. 172 frames. Oh, you can't see the frame count. Let's move me out of the way. Get out of the way, Jason. 172 frames. Jason with an S had 71. And then ST, 28 frames. As I was typing, it was changing the value of that first name field. This first name field's value is now Jason Story. So it was logging out the word Jason Story. If I stop playing, watch what happens to that first name field the data changes back and it reverts back. And that's a really important thing that's very. Um, I, it's a very important Unity thing to understand that when we play, when we hit play, all of our data, all of our saved serialized data here, these fields that we have that show in the inspector, they get saved off. And then when we stop playing, they get restored. And that's so that when we play a game, we don't lose the state of our game. It would be terrible if, if that didn't happen. The alternative is that every time we played our game, we would have to go back and reset and remove things. So it's a good behavior. It's just important to note that when you're playing, your changes generally don't save. All right, so let's go back into our player script and let's take a look at something else. Let's see, what else do we have here? We've taken a quick look at fields. Let's take a look at private fields next. 
We haven't mentioned those at all. So if we have a field that's marked as public, we've got this public string first name. It can be set in the inspector and it can be also read from other classes. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if I change this to private, which is the other keyword, there's public and private. There's also internal, but we're not going to worry about that. Most people don't even know it exists, I, I found. And most people rarely, rarely end up using it. Public and private are the two main ones that we have, though. If we change this to private and I save this off, and go back into Unity, you'll see that this first name is going to disappear. Oh, it's no longer available. Private fields can't be seen in the inspector. If I hit play now, because that value isn't saved in the inspector, it's actually empty and null. And you see that we get back null. Now, null just means that it's not been assigned. So first name was never assigned to anything. So it's just saying, hey, this was never assigned to anything. And you might run into things called null reference exceptions while you're doing your development. That just means that the object that you're using was never assigned to anything. It's like the most common error that you'll see. So what can we do with a private field? There are a couple things. One, we could set it in our other code. We can't set it in the inspector, but our start method could set it. We could say first name, equals and let's just pick somebody from chat we'll pick sean n sean n and we'll save that off because he's <laughs> talking about public and private stuff anyway I, well, i'm going to use his name anyway because he's on the chat and the first one that i saw with a nice big comment and it's a, i think a valid comment but i would still want to cover the differences so we've got our first name getting set here in the start method We'll save that. We'll go into Unity. And now if I hit play or let it reload, you should see that that value actually gets set. And when we start logging out that Sean and value there. There we go. Oops, I played and it logged. I'm going to hit play one more time. Just watch it log out. There you go. So you can see that it's, it's logging out that new value, even though I can't set it in the inspector. The other thing that you'll probably run into, and kind of the reason that I want to see this, is that a lot of the time fields will be private, but they're marked with a special attribute, and that's the serialized field attribute. So if you see this serialized field attribute, it could be private. And by the way, if it doesn't have a keyword, if you delete that, it's private by default. So if we have this serialized field attribute, and we go back into Unity, then it will show up in the inspector so that we can edit that value but we can't change it from outside of this class. So here we go. Now I could change this back and let's pick somebody else. And hit play. Oh, so here, check it out. So I put in a new name and it reverted back. The reason that it reverted back is that on line 13 here, I actually change it. So it doesn't matter what I set it to the, in the inspector, if we call code afterwards that changes it. So let's delete line 13. I'll hold shift and hit delete. That actually deletes out an entire line. We'll jump back into Unity. We'll hit play again, and we'll now see our first name again. Let's see. Play. There we go. Now it's working, and I can still change it. All right, let's stop playing. And I think I want to, I kind of want to talk about properties, but I think I want to talk about um, calling code on other scripts and objects and creating methods first. So let's jump into calling code on other scripts or on Unity built in scripts first. So let's jump into Unity and we're going to go back to our player. And I'm going to get rid of the, our first name because it's just an example. We don't need it. So I'll delete that out. I'm going to delete out our log entry on start. And I'm going to delete out our log entry in the update. And in our update, instead of um, just logging something out, I want to read from our input system. I'm going to do a real quick check to see if the player is pressing uh, some specific key. In fact, let's do it. Let's make it a key that we can set through a field. Oh, no, let's make it. Let's make it fire one first. We'll, we'll check to see if they click first, and then we'll go from there. So we'll say if on line 15, let's see, let's get this zoomed in. Uh, so inside of our update method, inside of the control for it, we're going to add an if statement. An if statement is going to evaluate the code inside of these braces. And if it's true, it'll run the stuff inside of its control braces there. So we'll say if input, which is another class that's built in, and I'm going to say Get, do I want to use get button down or you get key down? Let's use, I'll use the default of get button down. 
This is the one that you'll see probably the most often in tutorials. So you use get button down, which is a method on that input, and then we need to give it the name of the button. So I'll give it fire one, which is a default button in Unity. I'll show you where that is in just a minute. So if they've pressed that button and we add a closing brace here to match up these braces. So let's take a look at those braces real quick. The first set of braces inside here is for this get button down. We have an open and closing brace and then inside of it we have a string named fire one which needs quotation marks around it. Then we have this other set of braces. This outside set of braces is for the if statement. So this input dot get button down is actually going to return back a true or false. Let's take this and split it out a little bit. I'm going to delete that go up here and I'll say boolean or bool was clicked equals and I'll paste that in input dot get button down and then if was clicked is true so if I did click if this was true then I want to run some code inside of the braces for this if statement and the only reason I split that up is so that you can see what it looks like with these braces separated out this was clicked is essentially the same as having this little line of code here cut and paste it right in here. You just end up with the braces side by side. And it can get a little bit confusing, but if you get mixed up on them, just put the cursor next to it and move around. You can see where the braces align. Notice how they highlight like that. Okay, so if we press the fire down button, then I want to make our player do a quick jump. So the jump is actually a really simple thing to accomplish. If we look at Unity, we go back in here, we have this rigid body component that I added to the player. To add a rigid body component, you just hit the, let's here, let's go find it real quick. Hit the add component and you type in rigid body. Again, I added it and I froze the re rotation so that the character won't roll around. So that way it won't tip over, roll, or anything else. I left the position okay so that it can move with the physics system, but rotation's locked in. So if I want to access this rigid body, I can actually get that component from my player and then call some methods on it to make it do our jumping, to make it apply some force going upwards. Let's open up that player script again and let's make it do that jump up or make it apply that force. The first thing that we need to do is get a reference to that rigid body component. So I'll say var, which is short for variable. You can type in the type of the variable if you want, but var is a nice quick short key keyword for storing a variable of any type. So we'll say var rigid body equals get component and get component is one of those built-in methods. Let's zoom out a little bit. If you look at that mono behavior, get component is a method inside of there or I think it might be a couple layers deeper in the in the inheritance hierarchy, but in general you get the idea. It's it's a method built into mono behavior and we want to get component of a type. So we want to get a rigid body component. There are a bunch of different ways that you can call get component. You can call All right, we might be back up now. I don't know what happened there. Just everything rebooted and, and died out real quick. So I think we're good and we'll get, get started again. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I just totally crashed and uh, All right, there we go. Now I'm unmuted and, and we're good to go. So sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Is everything just kind of blew up and crashed and rebooted for no reason at all. I heard some weird crackling and then suddenly everything was unresponsive and I had to reboot. So we're almost back in. I've got Unity restarted. I'm going to get back into our scene in one second and then we'll uh, let me make sure that uh, Visual Studio is opening again. Oh, it doesn't need to recover that file and then we'll get we'll get started on the or back into the code all right get this lined up that goes right about here and we will jump back over all right so back into desktop mode oh whoops i got things all in weird places there we go i will line this up 
All right, so we were gonna get the rigid body component, but I've just broken my scene. So let's go through a quick 30 second reset up of the scene so everybody can see what that's like. If you didn't see how I set up the scene before, you're about to see it now. It's really, really quick though. So what we're gonna do is create, actually, wait, no, let's go into the sample scene. I bet I saved it in here. Never mind. I saved it in the sample scene. We're good to go. So I've got my player here. I've got my rigid body. I've got my rotation frozen and I've got a capsule collider. Nothing else other than a ground with a collider on it. Just a box collider scaled up to 10 by 10. Our player script here should now, um, oh, it doesn't read our input. So let's go rewrite that code. So our input code was going to do if input dot get button down. And again, we're reading the fire one, which is the going to be our jump. I'll show you where that is again in just a second. And if that's the case, we want to get the rigid body component. And I said we're going to store that in a variable using the var keyword. So I'll say var rigid body equals get component type rigid body. Now, this is where everything blew up. I was going to show that there are multiple ways to do it. I could do it by string name. I wouldn't recommend this. I could put in rigid body. And I think I don't remember if I need a capital there or not. That's not the way that I would do it. I could also do type of rigid body, which would get us back the type and this would work too. But what I would usually want to do and what you're going to see most of the time in your code or code that you read and write is the generic syntax where we use the less than greater than. So after get component, before our parentheses, we specify the type of component that we want to get. And we just want to get the rigid body component. And you're going to see that it's the same when we want to get our own components. If I want to get my player script, I would put get component player. Now it wouldn't make a lot of sense to get the player from the player. We're already in it. There's nothing to get. But if I was in another script and I wanted to get my player, that's what I would put. Control Z just undoes that though. And I've got my get component rigid body. This has an error though. If I put a semicolon at the end, it's going to say, hey, um, can't assign method group to an implicitly typed variable. And all this means is that Hey, Jason, you forgot your parentheses. You need an open and close parentheses because whenever we call a method, we have to have the open close parentheses. Now there can be parameters in it like we have in our get button down. It's got a single parameter that's a string of fire one or in our debug log, we've got a string called start, but we have parent or the, uh, we have the parentheses around our, uh, the got those around it either way. So whether there's a parameter or not, we need to have our, our open close parentheses. So now we've got our rigid body and that means that we can do something with it. So this rigid body, if I put my mouse over it, you'll see it says rigid body, rigid body. And I can, and, and when I say rigid body, rigid body, the uppercase blue one means that that's the class type. I could also put this as rigid body. And you'll see that some people really prefer to write it out as the specific class type. Personally, I don't really care as long as that it's named right and I can see what it is. I know what it is. Keeping it short doesn't bother me, but it'll work either way. And I want to make sure that you understand that var or the class name there will generally work in any scenario. So if you see one or the other, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just know that there's not a, a difference. It's just for syntax and making it easier to read. All right, let's see. We've got our rigid body. We want to make it jump. We can call methods on the rigid body. So just like we have start and update, rigid body has a whole bunch of things on it. We can type in R-I-G-I-D-B-O-D-Y and let's scroll down and I'll put in a dot. And what happens when I put in a dot in Visual Studio or VS Code or Writer is you're going to get an autocomplete menu and you're going to see all of the publicly accessible things on that class. So on a rigid body, it's got a mass value that's publicly accessible. You can see that it can be get or set. It's got a move position. Move position is a method. You can tell it's a method because it's got, well, if you look at the, the naming of it, we'll give you a kind of a clue. It's a, it's a verb. Uh, the fact that it has this little square box here, I'll tell you that, hey, it's a method. And the fact that it's got parameters there for a position. Now, the ones with the stars up here are the ones that I think they, they're kind of recommending you, you go with, or IntelliCode is recommending that you probably want to use, but that's not what we want to use. We, we can go through all of these different methods and use them or use different parts of them. The one that I want to use for this, and I, I know this because I've done a lot of Unity stuff, is just add force. If you look at rigid bodies, though, you want to look at how to do something with a rigid body, you could just Google the documentation for a rigid body on the Unity site. You'll see a giant list of all the methods and things that a rigid body can do. So once you have it or you're maybe you're going through this list and you're like, hey, what does add force 
at position do versus add force or add force rel add relative force. If you want to go through and see what those do, you can actually look at the documentation and get ex exact examples of how they work. So I'm going to use add force. We're going to do an open parentheses, and then we need to give it a force amount. So let's go through the different options here. Right now, you see that it says one of four. This is four different ways that I can call add force. And this is something to note on methods. When you have a method, it could have more than one parameter or more than one way to call it. The first way that it's recommending is by passing in a vector three of force. And a vector three is an X, Y, and a Z value that we can use to essentially give it the amount in each direction that we want to use. We can also use a vector three force with a force mode parameter. So that's an optional parameter. If I hit down, you see that's number two. Go to number three, I can use an X, Y, and a Z instead of a vector three or I can use an X, Y, and a Z and a force mode. Let's just use the X, Y, and the Z. So I'm gonna go zero for the X, and then for the Y, I'm gonna use, um, let's say maybe 500, and then I'm gonna use a zero for the Z. Now, to choose this method, or the one with that and no force mode, all I have to do is go to the end and hit semicolon. That little pop-up is just the giving me hints. It's not enforcing which one I'm on or anything. I don't have to type in that one. It's just enforcing that I use the correct one. Now, if I put a wrong number of parameters or something invalid, let's see. Oh, did zero actually work? There we go. Okay, now I'm getting an error saying that there's no overload that takes four. Force mode might actually be convertible to an int so it's actually working with with four but not with five parameters that's curious that was a, a bad example there okay so anyway i've got my add force method being called on the rigid body whenever we press the fire fire one button let's go try that out so we jump back into unity i've got the player script attached and it's on the same game object as the rigid body this is really important too because that get component call only looks for components that match on this object so let's hit play and see if we click or we hit our fire one, if we get a jump. Look at that, he jumps up when I click. So this is me left clicking or hitting the left control. Now I told you I was gonna show you what fire one is. Let's go take a look. Now stop playing. We'll go to edit and go to project settings and then we'll go to input manager. Expand out axes and look at this. I've got fire one, fire two and fire three. If I expand those out, we can actually see what they're bound to and how they're set up. This is part of the default or old input system in Unity, but it's still the one that's kind of set up by default. It's the one that you'll probably see used more often than not. So we've got fire one here and it's got a couple buttons. A positive button is left control. So that just means that, hey, if we hit left control, that counts as, a, as fire one or mouse zero, which is left click. We've also got down here that it counts for joystick button zero. So if we have a controller, I don't have uh, some kids stole on my PlayStation controllers, but if I had one set up here, I'd be able to click the PlayStation controller jump button, which I think is, uh, I think it's X is zero, but I, I can't remember the exact button. And that would allow me to jump as well. Now let's try mixing this up a little bit. Let's use a field or let's, let's go back and let's see what, what jump or fire two is. Let me go into project settings. Fire two is bound to left alt and fire three is bound to left shift. So, and then they're also bound to different mouse buttons. So let's make it so that's a variable that we can adjust in our code by setting up a field. I'm gonna go into the player script and what we're gonna do is replace this fire one with a field that we can use from, or well, that we can assign from the inspector. So to do that, I'll zoom out, make sure that the entire class is visible. And I'm gonna add a field up here. Actually, I'm just gonna rename this first name field. I'm gonna hit Control R, Control R to go into rename mode or F2 to go into rename mode. And I'll call this jump button. Then I'm gonna copy jump button and I'm gonna replace this fire one, but notice what I do with the quotes because it is important. So I'll take fire one, I'm gonna delete out the entire thing, including the quotes and paste in jump button with no quotes. If I put quotes around it, it's gonna literally look for a button named quote, jump button. That's not what I want. I want it to look for the value in my jump button text field. So let's save that. We'll go back into Unity. And then our first name field here should change to a jump button field. Any second now. And I'm gonna name this fire one. We'll play. And then I should be able to just left click or hit left control and jump. 
Left control, yep, looks like it jumps. And let's wait till I hit the ground. Left click jumps, yeah. Okay, let's change it to fire two. Now I left click, not jumping anymore. Left control, not jumping. Left alt jumps and right click jumps because that's what fire two is bound to. Let's go back into there, edit project settings and on the input manager again, expanding out the axes, fire two was bound to left alt. And if I change it to fire three, I'll get that left shift or I could change it to this jump which is actually bound to space. Let's try that. So let's try binding it to the button named jump or the input named jump. And now I hit space and it's bound to that. Now you might think, hey, do we want to bind it this way? I don't know. I mean, it just depends. This is really just an example of how you would bind or how you can access a field and read it and you know make that change at li live at runtime or from anywhere else, I guess. All right, let's jump. I need to get my Milanote board back up. Pull this thing up. I shared the Milanote board down below, by the way, if anybody wants to check it out, um, go over some of the the basic stuff that we're covering. So calling code on other scripts. Let's pull this over here. Got this one. We've kind of, we've done that. Let's talk about creating um, methods and properties and calling code on other scripts that you create. I want to do that next. So let's say that I've got a, um, let's see, what do I want to do this on? Let's make a collision. I'm going to make it so that when I walk into a, a bad area, my game restarts and the player dies. So keep it relatively simple, but with a second script that accesses the player. So I want to be able to have a kill area that kills my player. Let's go into the Unity and let's create a new ground area. So I'm going to go to Scene View. I'm going to duplicate my ground. Let's see if I can if I can get my mouse control. Oh, oh I'm, I'm in play mode. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. It's like, what is going on here? Got no mouse control, nothing. Um, there we go. All right. So we've got our ground. Let's duplicate it. I'm going to hold control. If you hold control while you drag and move things, it'll snap their position. Move it over here, and I'm going to call this deadly ground. And then I'm going to make it, I think, red. So I'm going to create a new material. Just make it like a, a scary dead area. Let's see. Actually, I want to move that somewhere to where it's visible, though, on the on the game view. There we go. I've got my deadly red area or it's not red yet, but what is going on here? All right, I'm losing mouse control. It's really weird. It's not letting me uh not letting me right click. It's just strange. All right, so we're going to create a material. I'm going to go to game object and go to where is my material option in game object? It's not actually game. There we go. I was trying to get to the right click menu. It's not in game object at all. So I need to go right click, create, and I want to choose material. And I'm going to call this red. I'm going to just choose a red color for it. And then I'm going to assign it to that block. Select that block, duplicate it. And I'm going to move one over here. And then I'll move one over here. So I've got, I'm surrounded by deadly areas that the goal is to have kill the player. Let's get that touching. There we go. So if I move on to any of those red areas, my player is going to die. Now I need to write the code to kill the player. So I'm going to create a new script. And I want to do that by right clicking down here, choosing create and choosing C sharp script. I'm going to call this kill player area. Give it a nice long name. And when you're naming a script in C sharp or in unity, it's generally recommended to go with this naming format where you capitalize the first letter of each word. So Kill is capitalized, player is capitalized, and area is capitalized. All right, let's open up that script and let's take a look at it. So our kill player area script is going to default to looking just like our player script did, where we have a start method and an update method. And give me one second. I'm going to try to get control of this mouse again. There we go. It's acting up, acting strange. All right, I think I've fixed it though. So we've got our kill player area. It's a mono behavior, just like our player was, with a start and an update method. Now we're going to delete both of those, the start and the update method and the comments out of there. We don't necessarily need those there. They're just automatically added as a starting point or a default way to get you started with your game object so that you know kind of how to begin. You don't necessarily need them there. And it's a template that you can actually change out later on if you want. So I've got my kill player area and I want to use one of the Unity built-in methods that is, I'd say, probably the most common and most useful ones that you can find. It's probably not the most, but one of at least the top five. And that's the collision detection method. 
and we can do that with the on collision enter notice that as i start typing onc though all of these options start auto appearing there's a on collision enter on collision stay on connected to server all kinds of different things that are somewhat built into unity and some are built into other stuff that writer or visual studio are catching but in general the ones that i want to find are the on collision so i'm going to take on collision enter and i didn't have to type it all out notice i just started typing it hit enter and it auto completed and filled out my on collision enter also important to note that there's a 2d version of this if you see here it says on collision enter 2d wrong one that's for 2d game development when you're using sprites we're not using sprites in this version i'm in 3d i have a 3d rigid body this won't work you have to use a rigid body 2d for the 2d one just delete it recreate it as on collision enter so on collision enter is a method that gets called whenever our game object our kill player area collides with any other object that has a collider on it when that happens we can actually get the player component from that collision and do something with it. And I've talked about calling something on another script. Let's talk, let's try it now. So on collision enter, let's get the player script from the collision. So we'll say var player equals collision. And then we want to say dot collider dot get component and give it the type of player. So this is going to, the collider is the thing that we hit. If you look at it, you look at the collision. Collision's the parameter that's automatically passed into this method. This on collision enter method gets called automatically. Let's zoom it in a little bit by unity when we collide and it passes in this collision, which has some data on it. It's not just the collider. If I hit dot, you can see that it's got a contact count, all of the contacts that hit. We can get the direction of the hit, where it hit, the exact point and all that stuff. But right now I just want the collider, the actual object, which is gonna be a box collider or in our case, a capsule collider that's on our player. And then we call the get component method on that collider and say, hey, give me the player. And anything that's a component on in Unity on a game object is going to have access to get component because they all derive from that mono behavior base class. So this will get me the player. Now, if I collided with a player, it's gonna get me the player. If I collided with something else, like maybe there's a random ball rolling around that's not a player, this is going to be null. So usually what you'll see after this is something like if player is not equal to null. And that's to make sure that, hey, the thing that we hit is actually the player and it's not some other object that somebody added to the scene. Maybe it was a rocket that they lobbed over there or something. You know, you want to make sure that you're not dealing with that and killing the player. So if the player is not equal to null, then we'll call this code inside of our control braces again. And that code, oh, well, let's see, what do we want to do on it? Let's tell it to change their jump button. Instead of killing them, I won't make it a kill area. I'll make it a confuse area. We'll change their jump button. So I'll say player dot, and now we're going to make a new method. I'd mentioned we would create a new method. Creating methods right here. Let's get into that. We're going to create a new method called um, change or randomize jump. And we'll add a open close parentheses and a semicolon. Now I want to show you the way that I create methods. There are two ways to create methods. One is that I could go over to my player and I could zoom out and I could start typing down here inside of these control braces. Got to be inside of it, not outside. Make sure that I'm not inside of another method either. So after the update methods end, I could say public void randomize. What did I call it? Randomize uh, jump. Jump open close parentheses and add my braces i could do it that way the way that i do it though because i don't like to type as much and i like to take shortcuts is i go in here and i select my randomized jump method that says there's an error that it doesn't have a definition i hit alt enter and i hit enter again to generate that method then i hit f12 and it takes me right to it and then i get that weird internal keyword so i'd mentioned that people don't generally use the internal keyword but you will see it automatically created it's technically a little bit safer than public but i'm going to change it to public because that's what we normally see and what we're you're going to see in most of your code when you do that though you get this throw new not implemented exception just delete that out and put your code in here so in our randomized jump i want to just change what our jump button is so i want to make it so that we've got maybe three different jump button options. Maybe it could be fire one, fire two, or fire three. And I'll just pick one of those at random, just to kind of mess with the player, make it a little bit interesting. I mean, it's not that interesting, but be able to call this method from here and have it do something. So let's randomize our jump by changing our jump button. I'll say that, well, first let's pick a, a fire number. So I'll say int number equals 
and we're going to use some randomization code. We'll call the unity engine dot random dot range and we're going to give it a value of one to three and then we'll put in a semicolon. Now random dot range returns back a number. It says inclusive if we're using integers. So the first number is inclusive, the one. So it'll give us a number from one up to three. But if you look at that, it says exclusive. The one, the three is not actually included in our count. So we could get a number one or two, but we couldn't get a three like this. So I'm going to bump this up to four, giving us a number between one or one, two or three. So a number between one and four, excluding four. Again, you put the mouse over, you can see the little exclusive. It's tiny there, but int max exclusive is there. So this is going to give us a random number between one and three. And then I'm going to say jump button equals and here we're going to do a little bit of string concatenation we're going to combine a string with a number to make a new string so put in the quotation marks the word fire and then we'll outside of the quotation marks put a plus and the number not null number and a semicolon so now our jump button is going to change to be a fire button that's just a random button let's try that out we'll save We'll go into kill play area. Notice this little star here. That means that my file isn't saved. One of the tricks that I use a lot of the time is hold down control shift and hit B and that does a build. It saves all of the files and builds at the same time. And that's under what build and uh, build solution. I think, I don't know. Control shift B is the hotkey that I use. F6 also looks like is, is valid here in visual studio. All right. So I've got that code set up. I'm going to jump over to unity. I'm going to select our player. And then we're going to run around and see if our jump button changes. Oh, I didn't give myself a way to move. <laughs> Let's give ourselves a way to move first so that we can actually uh, jump into things. Oh, you know what? Here's, here's a way. Instead of giving ourselves a way to move, I'm going to move my deadly ground and I'm going to make a, de a deadly ceiling. Much easier. So we'll take our deadly ceiling. Oh, no. You know what? Better idea. I like this idea much better. I'm going to stop playing. I'm going to change my ground and I'm just going to add the deadly ground script or the kill play area, kill player area to that script or to that ground object. In fact, I'm going to rename it. So I'm going to open up my kill player area, rename it, control R, control R. I'm going to call this change jump on enter because it's best to name the objects and the scripts for what they actually do so that it makes sense. And this is what it's doing. It's changing jump on enter. We'll save that off. And now my, my deadly grounds aren't really deadly. They're just kind of an outline. And my white area should change my jump button every time I enter it. So every time I land, my jump button should change. I like that a lot better than my last idea of killing the player. There's really no reason to kill him. Let's change the jump button. So I jump, say I land, and now my jump button changed to fire three. See that? So fire three was what? Alt, let's see, is it Alt, Shift? Okay, I jump and I land and now it's on fire one, which is control. And now it goes to fire two. Oh, it looks like it's alt. I can jump again, fire three. And it's not sequential. It, it kind of seemed sequential there. There we go, fire two. But you can see how it's it's changing and it's running, calling that code. So my ground object here, this change jump on enter, when we collide is finding the player that collided with it and randomizing the jump. All right, I want to do one last thing and then wrap it up because I've got a meeting that I've got to jump into. And that's show how to find an object um, anywhere in the scene so that you can do something on that as well. So let's say I want to randomize the jump based on hitting a hotkey in, in our game. Let's go add in a hotkey reader object. So I'm going to go game object, create empty. I'm going to name this hotkey reader. I'm going to add a, I'll reset the transform position. It doesn't matter at all, but I'm going to reset it anyway. I'll add a component. We'll create a new script and I'll call this hotkey reader. And then let's open up that script. I got to double click it. Visual Studio opened without op going to the script. And then in the update method, I'm just going to check to see if I've pressed some certain hotkey. And if I have, I'll change the player and I'll make an update to the player and maybe have them change their jump. To do that though, I want to make well, actually, no, I don't want to cache it. I'm just going to delete out my start method completely and I'll implement it in the update. So I'll say if input dot, and now we're not going to use get button down. We're going to use get key down and I'm going to use a key code and the key code allows me to specify basically any key on my keyboard. And I'm going to say chosen hotkey. 
We don't have a hotkey selected yet, but this is the way that I would write it. So I'll create a chosen hotkey and then add in my control braces. And this might be a little confusing because I've got an error here and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to capitalize this C. I'm going to hit Alt Enter and I'm going to hit generate a variable and we're going to create a field. We'll make it public so that we can see it in the inspector. We could, of course, make it that serialized field and private so we could see it in the inspector. But now what's going to happen is if our player presses the chosen hotkey, we'll run the code inside of our control section. In our control section, I want to call our player's randomized jump, so I need to get a reference to it. Now, to get a reference to an object, if there's only one of it in the scene, there are a couple ways to do it, but one of the easiest and most common ways is to assign it using the find object of type method. So I'm going to say var player equals, and we'll use find object of type. And just like we'd use for get component, we're going to use a generic statement. So we use the less than sign, put in the word player with a capital P, which is the class type. I hit F12, you can see that's the name of the class. And then our open close parentheses. Once we've done that, we can call player dot, let's see, randomize jump, open close parentheses, and our semicolon. So now when we press the chosen hotkey, we will find the player in our scene or in our loaded game and then randomize the jump of that player. Let's save, jump into Unity, and let's go assign a hotkey to it and try it out. So I look at my hotkey reader and look at that, I've got a nice drop down. Because I'm using a character type, see how it has key code here? Because key code is the type, I actually just get a nice drop down where I can pick the key code that I want. I'm going to choose, I think, um, Let's see, what do I want to go with? Let's try something simple. Let's scroll down here off the list. Um, I think I'll try alpha five. So key, key five or the number five on my keyboard. So that should change out my jump method. I'll hit play, we'll select our player. And then as I hit five on the keyboard, look at that, my jump button changes. So every time I hit five, that jump button changes and the way that I jump has to change. You can see how we access that player from outside of the script. All right, I think that covers all of the things I wanted to hit except for properties and those might be just a little too advanced for now so I might just come back to those later. Um, if there are questions about this, I guess just drop them in chat, drop them in comments afterwards too and I'll go through them and maybe we'll do a follow up on this. I think that the fundamentals are I hopefully mostly covered there, but I've got to run off to a meeting. So we'll jump back and maybe do this again. It looks like it's relatively interesting and popular. So if you guys uh, like this, make sure that you hit like, subscribe, share, and all that stuff. And then um, maybe we can do this somewhat regularly, go through some fundamental stuff um, in addition to all the advanced stuff that I like to do. Also, I put a link to um, my free beginner course down below. You feel free to check that out. And there's a new version of it that I need to drop on there too. Um, I just need to get that one set up. It's got some updated quizzes and stuff too. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check it out. All right. Um, thanks again, everybody. I got to get running, get off to this meeting, but um, I'll see you again on, I guess, Sunday. Make sure that you're already queued up for the game dev show. If I have already set that up, if not, I'll set it up right away. And I guess I'll see everybody soon. Thanks again. And um, goodbye.